Sound is speeding on take three. Ron Sharp, Saturday, take three. Was that in both? Sorry, let's do this. All right. And again, okay, if you don't mind, just go back to. Uh, the boycott? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it just so happened that the pain that I was feeling in my left leg the previous Tuesday was a massive blood clot in the femoral vein of that left leg. And for days it had been breaking apart and those little pieces of that clot were getting lodged into my lungs. So how none of those, lo none of those blood clots left my lungs, we have no idea. But luckily they didn't and I'm still here. Um, but like I said, I w it, it, that should have been something that would have really scared a person. I was calm through everything. Um, the doctors were surprised that I wasn't panicking and freaking out. My wife was panicking and freaking out a little bit, um, but I just, I felt calm and I think that helped me through my, my treatment. And I think that's one of the things that really helped me through Suzix is that I've been able to just remain calm and take things as they go and roll with things and um, just look at every day when I wake up and I can still see what I can see. It's a good day. Um, so I, I just try to keep a good attitude with everything. Um, so my treatments, the last, the last treatment I did was in September of 2009. And when I finished that treatment, other than just the peripheral vision and the vision I lost in 2007, I felt perfectly fine. I was determined to live my life as if I didn't have Suzix. Um, I wasn't gonna let Suzix run who I was or determine what I could do. So I stayed coaching. I, I coached both of my boys' Little League football teams. I stayed coaching freshman football at Desert Hills Middle School. Um, I still drove, I had a driver's license. I, I still tried to play basketball myself other than the fact that I wasn't quite as good. You kind of need good eyesight to play competitive basketball. Um, but I, I tried to do all the things that I had done before just so Suzix wasn't gonna become me. I, I wasn't gonna change myself. Um, and then just as far as my teaching and coaching, that was a huge part of things. One of the things that really helped get me through all my treatments and then, you know, dealing with the eyesight loss and, and that was my children. Um, like families are huge to me and my children were pretty young. When I first suffered from Suzix in 2002, my daughter was eight, my oldest son was six, and then my youngest son was four. And I, I looked at them and I thought, there's no way that I'm not gonna be a part of their lives. So, I mean, I would have had to have been, <laughs> I think I would have had to have been dead to not have been involved in what they did. So I, like I said, I stayed coaching them and. Um, with my wife, we were real involved in their education and school and being a teacher myself. You know, I, was, I wasn't going to let my, my own kids not take school seriously. So um, as a result, all of my kids have been successful in school. Uh, my daughter right now is almost 22 in her fourth year in college, and she runs cross-country and track for Utah Valley University and has a 3.7 or 8 GPA at Utah Valley. Um, she graduated with a almost a 4.0 from high school. My oldest son, he graduated with a 4.0 from high school and he'll be running cross country and track at Utah Valley also. And then my youngest son, he's a, a senior at Desert Hills High School and he's almost at a 4.0 also. And he is currently starting his senior year of track and he's got three schools that he can, he's gonna to try to choose to go to with a track scholarship. So they've all been successful. Um, and I, I look back at it now and I think, had I let Suzik syndrome discourage me from, from doing those things, the coaching, being active with my kids, then where would they be? You know, and a lot of it was my wife. She, she was behind me the whole time you know, during my treatments, she would drive me there, she would bring me food, she would pick me up. Um, she, so she's been there through everything and uh, to her credit, she's, 
she never stopped helping and loving and serving. And so I credit her for a lot of what our kids are. Um, but it's also, you know, it has to do a lot with faith and, you know, this is a really tight-knit community. Um, our neighbors, when I was going through treatment and when I was in the hospital, I mean, we had neighbors bringing our, my wife and kids dinner every night. And so just a, a great community to be in. Um, now, as far as my current situation, um, my eyesight right now, I would say that I have about, so since 2007, I, I've had one other little episode of Suzuk syndrome, and that was in the spring of 2014. And I was actually teaching school at the time, and I was during one of my classes. While I was teaching, I started to feel that blood pressure drop again, like had happened in 2007. And I tried to fight it off, but I'm thinking, no, this can't, can't be happening. But it, it kept happening. I'm like, I feel like I could pass out any time. So luckily, my students had already had an assignment. So I heard and just said, hey, for the next minute or two, work on this assignment. I've got to run down to the office. And from my classroom down to the office, to where the faculty restroom was, I was struggling. I, I was like, I hope I just make it there. So I, I got into the restroom and um, sat down up against the wall and just tried to fight off passing out. And I, my wife actually works here at the school too. And so I pulled out my phone and I sent her a text and I said, hey, can you run down to my classroom and watch my classroom? I'm in the bathroom right now about to pass out. So she goes downstairs and watches my room and I, I probably sat there for about 10 minutes and then I kind of felt that feeling pass. So I got up and I actually walked outside, got some fresh air, walked back in and then for the last period of the day, I actually sat in my chair and taught from my chair, which was really weird because I was always up around moving. Um, but that day I went home from school and felt this urge to just had this sick stomach like I was gonna throw up. And so I laid in bed trying to fight it off. Um, finally, after about an hour in bed, I couldn't fight it off anymore. So I got up and I headed into the bathroom and was just about to throw up and passed out. And when I passed out, I, I hit the wall in the bathroom and my son, who is 19 years old now, he heard that first and came in and here I am passed out in the bathroom and he was a little bit scared. You know, he calls out for my wife and she comes in and she actually pulls me, pulls me up and I came to and when I came to I felt sick and I, so I threw up, um, got back in bed, but I could tell I'd lost a little teeny bit more vision. Um, not, not a whole lot, but just, just enough to notice it. Um, so right now my visual fields in my right eye, I would say I have about 30% of my vision in my right eye. The left eye is a little bit better. There's about 70% in my left eye. And I'll tell you what the neuro-ophthalmologist at the Moran Eye Center told me about your eyes. She has said, your eyes are amazing. What you can't see out of your right eye, if you can see that in your left eye, that compensates for it. So luckily for me, the, vi the visual areas of my right eye that I've lost, for the most part, I have those visual areas in the left eye. So it compensates. So when I'm looking straight ahead, you know, I can see really well. I can read things and, and drive, things like that. Um, still don't have the peripheral vision, but who needs that? So um, anyway, and so through this challenge, um, the, here's the things I try to remember. So obviously I've lost certain abilities. Like I used to be a pretty avid basketball player. I would play in city leagues and things like that, and it was, was actually fairly good. Um, haven't been able to play competitive in basketball, which I really miss doing, but that's basketball. Life is more than just basketball. Um, and that's kind of when I started getting more involved in the weightlifting because I figured I don't have to see basketballs being thrown to me or set screens or things like that in the weight room. So weightlifting has become my pastime now. Um, and I always think to myself, and I, I try to teach the kids that I have coached and lifted with, that there are a handful of things that take zero talent. So 
you know, you could be a good basketball player, a football player, or whatever, that requires some talent. Well, there's things that require no talent, like your work ethic. It takes zero talent to have a good work ethic. Zero talent to treat people the way they're supposed to be treated. Um, zero talent to put the, your best effort into things. Um, zero talent to have a good attitude. So these are all the things that I try to try to teach these boys that I've been working with in the weight room and when I was teaching in the classroom, try to instill that kind of thing in the, the students that I taught just to, to make the things that they're going through because everybody has challenges. And that's the one thing that, I, that I've realized with Suzuki syndrome because initially, you know, I would look at people and think, why me? Like, why is it me that is going through this? Why not that guy? You know, I'd see someone playing basketball and, why isn't he get, you know, why isn't he where I'm at? Why, why am I not out there playing basketball? So, you, you know, just being human, you kind of think those things naturally. And, um, but, you know, you start to realize that everyone has adversity. It's all different. Like this person's adversity for them could be really difficult. For you, it might not be, but the adversity you're going through is difficult for you. So through adversity, I think, number one, for myself and just, for my personal opinion, it has helped me be more humble. So I've learned humility with Suzuki syndrome. Definitely helped me be more grateful and have more gratitude. Um, you know, grateful for the things I can still do. Grateful for my job that I can still do. Grateful for my family and my neighbors and you know the the members of my church that I go to that have been there all the time for me. So just being more thankful and grateful for everything. Um, and it just helps you appreciate things more. And it definitely has also made me more empathetic towards people. Um, the, the Facebook page for Suzuki Syndrome, which I joined in 2011, that's been a huge support. Um, it kind of breaks my heart sometimes, though, when I, when I read things from some of the people that suffer from Suzix, which is such a crazy disease because it affects this person this way and this person totally different, but it's the same disease. Um, I know there's some people that are in a lot worse situations than I am with the health because of Suzix, and that breaks my heart. I want to, you want to help them. Okay. In 2011, I was able to come across the Suzuki Syndrome Facebook page and join that group. And that Facebook page has been a huge blessing to me. It's, I've gotten a lot of support from that page, especially early on in 2011. Um, just being able to communicate with other people with Suzuki Syndrome and share your story with them and see what they're going through which at some points can be kind of heartbreaking to read other, other patients' Facebook posts about the trials they're going through and, and what they're struggling with. And sometimes I know what to tell them and sometimes you don't. And the times you don't know what to say, it's really hard because you want to help them so bad. Um, but I know that that Facebook page has been a, a big support for a lot of people with Suzuki Syndrome. Um, Wow, now I lost my train. Now, okay. where do I go from here? Uh, I, do have a, I do have a couple questions. One of the things that I had um, asked uh, a couple different people, and one of, we'll go, go to a couple things because you were talking in the gym yesterday about, about the kids that you work with in the gym not knowing about right. the. Um, would you mind just sort of uh, going through that one more time? Because I was kind of wishing the cameras were rolling when you were talking right. about Right. Okay. Um, so I guess that's just it, is, is to say, uh, you know, I guess the question is, do, do the kids you work with, do, you, do your students know, I mean, I know you said earlier that the students, you would ask the students not that your immune system is compromised, but I guess the kids working out, we'll cut that together a little bit, but right. the, the kids you work out with, do they know about Suzak's, about okay. your, that you have Suzak's? Okay. All right. So... Through this whole journey with Suzuki Syndrome, I've been pretty private with it as far as sharing what I'm going through with um, not only my colleagues but with students because when I look at myself in the mirror, I look at myself as perfectly normal. You can't really tell I've got any 
strange autoimmune condition. Um, you look in my eyes, they look like normal eyes. So I don't go out and, and advertise that I have Suzuk syndrome to everybody. Um, the students that I teach or have taught, the students that I've coached and work with in the weight room, they for the most part have no idea what I'm going through and that's perfectly fine with me. Um, the kids that I lift with every year, towards the end of the year I usually tell them what, you know, what's happening or my, my kids that I taught in, in science, I would use that sometimes as a lesson, especially when I taught biology. Um, talked to them about the retina and, and autoimmune diseases and things like that. Um, I've actually shown my students the pictures of my, my visual fields that have been taken and it, they look at those and kind of shake their head like, can you see us? Because when, when you look at my visual fields and you see all the areas that I can't see and you're not seeing through my eyes, you look at those and you're thinking, can you see me? And um, even Dr. Warner, when I went to the Moran Eye Center in 2007, said the same thing. When she walked into the room, she was kind of looking at me funny and I'm looking at her going, why are you looking at me weird? She goes, can you see me okay? And I was like, yeah, of course. So, um, like I said, your eyes are amazing organs. So when they piece things together and your brain pieces it all together, you know, you can see a lot better than what those visual fields would show you. Um, but no, I haven't been openly advertising with, with what I've got to people just because I haven't felt the need to. And, and I don't want people feeling sorry for me. Um, which I think is part of it. I just want to be normal Mr. Sharp and do weightlifting and coach and not have the kids wonder, oh, what's wrong with Mr. Sharp? Is he okay? Things like that. So I don't, I never wanted anyone to feel bad for me. So I, I probably just kept it pretty private. You know, and if someone asks, I tell them and talk to them about it. And obviously my neighbors and other people know. Um, a lot of the teachers that are at this school probably have no idea that I can't, see as well as other people or don't have the visual fields and they don't know what I've been through. Um, but that's fine with me. I, it doesn't bother me that they don't know. Um, uh, one of the things I've asked uh, everyone else is that uh, if you could sort of explain or, or just sort of um, talk about how, what, what, why you think a project like this, this film project is important, like what you would, you know, why you think it's important and what you would want somebody that maybe does, is, is doing research online and if they were to sort of come across, you know. I right. Guess let's start with why you think this film project is important. Okay. Um, so this film project that we're doing, I think is going to be a vital part of educating people about Suzuk syndrome. For example, had this been available in 2002, um, I probably wouldn't have lost the amount of vision that I have lost. So, you know, I credit the people that are putting this together, Nancy Goldhammer, who has Suzuk Syndrome, the director of the film. Um, I credit your, your, the initiative and the insight that you guys have had to do this because just with the Facebook page, the only people that you were educating is each other, but if we could educate doctors and other people about Suzuk syndrome, especially insurance companies, because like I said, I was fortunate enough that there was a person in that doctor's office that was willing to put in the time to convince the makers of the Rituxim to donate it. Otherwise, I'd be tens of thousand dollars in debt just because of this medication. So, and I, I know from reading people's posts on the Facebook page that they battle with insurance companies. Well, maybe if insurance companies can see something like this and realize that it's a real thing and people are suffering from it and it's not experimental. You know, there's, there's actual results from certain medications that, that they need to look at and take more seriously. I think it will help people who are suffering from it now or people who go in with some of these symptoms and a doctor can now look and research and see this and have a better understanding of how it's going to be treated. So I think this, this project is, is paramount to allowing people to be educated about Suzuk syndrome. Okay, great. And then the other thing I was going to say is, or ask you, is if, if 
if somebody were having similar symptoms or somebody was having symptoms of any sort and came across this film, you know, what would be something that you would want to say to them if they're sitting there like watching, looking at stuff online, trying to find, get some information about right. what's going on with them? Right. You know? Okay. Um, if, if you were a, just the average person and you started to develop certain symptoms, for example, with anything related to your eyes, whether you are seeing flashing things in your eyes or um, you're feeling to the point where you're, you're suddenly just feeling sick, like you have to throw up, then obviously that's something that's going on in your brain. So those things all have to do with that central nervous system. So anything with your eyes or hearing loss or you know sudden, sudden bouts of fainting and passing out, I would not wait to get that stuff checked out. I would definitely go in immediately. Um, the sooner that a doctor can know about it and the sooner you can be treated, the, the in, that increases your chances of recovering quicker or if you've already lost vision, for example, had I gone in immediately and had we found out immediately that I had Suzik syndrome, was able to start treatment right then, there's a good chance that some of the vision that I had lost could have been recovered. Um, at this point, not so much, but so I would, you know, I would hope that anyone that were to see this, if you had any kind of symptoms with the visual issues or hearing issues or sudden bouts of fainting or getting sick instantly, I would definitely have that checked out because that's all related to the brain and the central nervous system. There could be things going on up there that you definitely want to have checked out. Okay. I haven't. So from what I know, what I understand is that Suzik syndrome, how it affects people differently, there's a, a segment of that that's mainly focused with the eye. So, you know, for example, myself, mine is mainly with the vision. So I have the low tone hearing loss in the right ear, but it's not a big deal. You know, I can still hear. Um, my brain is functioning perfectly fine. I've never had the cognitive issues with Suzik syndrome with the brain. So I've never had the memory loss, um, confusion, anything like that, the vertigo that some, some people have. So mine has mainly been the visual Suzik syndrome where I've lost, lost vision. But no, I haven't had to deal with the things that I read on the post and it really breaks my heart because I, I imagine what they're going through and it can't be good. So, um, can you 